And it seems to us, as we're reading along, this is ancient history. This is stuff that happened two and a half thousand years ago, isn't it? It's the, in a very different world, it wasn't any internet, it wasn't any other things like that. You know, there's no trains or cars, it was uh, horses and chariots, and it was a very long time ago. And Isaiah, when we come to the, the book we're now reading through, it time warps back 150 years to the decade uh, just before the Assyrians captured the northern kingdom. That's where Isaiah began his ministry, just before the collapse of the northern kingdom. Now he's based in Jerusalem, and he's looking forward, he can see all the bad kings around him, and he's looking forward to a good king who will arise out of David's descendants in the southern kingdom. And he's looking, he can see that Israel, that Judah, sorry, the southern kingdom is going to fall, it's going to be taken into exile in Babylon. Um, but he sees that there will be a rebirth of the land of Judea, and that there will be a new king who will be established uh, within Judea, and that all of the nations of the earth will come and flock to this new king who will arise from David's fallen stump. His family tree that's been cut off, the earth, you know, shoots will arise, and then all the nations will come to this shoot. And we read at the very beginning of Isaiah here, in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, we read this. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of all the mountains. It will be exalted above all the hills, and all the nations will spring to it. Many people will come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. And the law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord, from Jerusalem. So Isaiah here is seeing this end time, sort of restoration and rebuilding of the kingdom of Judah. Uh, it says, in the last days. Okay, so this is in the last days. And it says, all nations, so that's all of us, all of the nations of the earth, will stream to Jerusalem to know God's ways and to walk in his path. <coughs> now, this is a picture of the messianic kingdom when our Lord Jesus Christ is reigning over the earth from Jerusalem. That all of the nations will come. To hear him, and it says, The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. It's a picture of the rule and the reign of David's family over the nations. And so, this is just the picture because when we know the end, we can then see how the rest of history is written in the light of the end. We talked about that on Good Friday, and I'll return to that theme again in a bit. But this is the end picture we get at the end, of all the nations coming up to Jerusalem to worship the Messianic King. And so all of history there is read in that light, in light of the end of what it will be, then shows us the direction of history. So theme number one that I'm going to be bringing out this morning is the theme of the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 6, we read this, chapter in verses 1 to 5. So this is Isaiah 6, 1 to 5. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on high, elevated throne. The hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs stood over him. Each one had six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. And they used the remaining two to fly. And they called out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. His majestic splendor fills the entire earth. And the sound of his voice shook the door frames of the temple was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe to me, I am destroyed, for my lips are contaminated by sin. I live among people whose lips are contaminated by sin. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of heaven's armies. So 
This is a vision that Isaiah has when he's in the temple and he sees the king, the lord of heaven's armies, in front, you know, his robes are filling the whole temple, along with smoke. And he sees the seraphs as well. The seraphs are like um, winged serpents. So they're these serpents with six wings who are flying around and over the king who's in front. And the question I want to raise just at the beginning is, who is the one in the front? Who is the one that Isaiah has seen? He's referred to as the Lord, Adonai, who is seated on high. He's referred to as the King, the Lord of Heaven's armies. But in John's Gospel, in John chapter 1, verse 18, we read, No one has ever seen God at any time. The only Son who is at the Father's side has made him known. And I think this is important because when we talk about God, we mean the Father who is the source and the ground of all that exists. <coughs> in him, Paul says, we live and breathe and have our being. He's not like a, a man who's up in the sky somewhere. He's the one who is causing everything to exist moment by moment. He cannot be seen in that sense because no eye can see him. He's the one who is causing us to exist. And so John says, but the only Son has made him known. Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16 of God, he says, He alone possesses immortality and lives in inappropriate, inapproachable light, whom no human has ever seen or is able to see. To him be glory and eternal power. Amen. So the question is, is who did Isaiah see? Sat on the throne with the seraphim dancing around him. Whenever people in the Hebrew Scriptures see God, who do they see? And the answer is that they see <coughs> They see Jesus Christ, the crucified and risen one. As Paul says, the Father no human has ever seen or is able to be seen. And John in his gospel goes as far to identify this. He says in John chapter 12, verse 41, Isaiah said these things because he saw Christ's glory and he spoke about him. He saw Christ's glory and he spoke about him. And I think this is important because whenever we talk about God, we must talk about our Lord Jesus Christ because he is the image of Whenever we want to know what God is like, we cannot know what God and the Father is like, but we can know what Christ is like as he has revealed what God is like to us. <coughs> and in Ezekiel chapter 10, Ezekiel, one of the other prophets, he's in Babylon, he's in exile, um, he's at the river, and he in Iraq, he's at the Tigris and Euphrates, and he can see in a vision the glory of the Lord leaving the temple in Jerusalem, and it goes away. And it's the presence of God leaving the temple. And when the Jews do return back to the land of Israel, when they leave um, Iraq and they travel back across the deserts to the land of Israel, um, in sort of you know, 500 BC, um, they return Ezra and Nehemiah, they rebuild the temple, but it's not the same. You don't get the fire descending from on high like you did when Solomon built the temple or when Moses built the tabernacle. You don't get these big experiences because the glory of God hasn't returned in the same way. And so when we read the Gospels, Jesus Returning glory of God, who is now coming to make people clean. And so when he meets unclean people, instead of becoming unclean, he makes them clean. Because he's like that coal <coughs> that Isaiah sees in the image, that when he touches his unclean lips, they're purified. But Jesus is so pure that whenever he touches people, 
their purity is changed and he destroys them. So Jesus is the one who makes the Father known. And so how does he reveal God? The one on the cross, how does he reveal God? That he loves his enemies. Jesus says, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you. Because then you will be like your Father in heaven, who makes the sun to shine on both the righteous and the unrighteous. He makes the crops grow on good and bad people. And that's how we should also behave. To care for the other, whoever the other might be, our enemy. Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan, doesn't he? You know, the, the Jews and the Samaritans didn't get on, they hated one another. And yet Jesus says that actually it's the Samaritan who was the good one. It wasn't the religious person, it wasn't the priest or the Pharisee, it was the Samaritan who cared for his neighbour, who is the righteous one. And Paul says that whilst we were still enemies, He's one who forgives his enemies and dies for his enemies. So Christ restores the image of God to man. He shows us what it is that we should live like in order that we might truly become what God has created us as humans to be, to represent him in the world. This leads us to theme number two, the promised child. And the first half of, um, of Isaiah is filled with those Christmas passages that we come to every year. So they're, they're the verses that we're very, very familiar with because we read them every year. Um, and I just want to just think about that in the light of what I was chatting about on Good Friday, about history's view in the light of the end. Jesus didn't come because Isaiah saw it. Isaiah saw it because Jesus came. Okay? That's the way that history works. Because it's written in light of the end. Okay? So Jesus came, and therefore Isaiah saw it. Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, speaks of the Lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. Christ and him crucified was God's plan before the foundations of the world and therefore we existed so that Christ had someone to die for, in that sense. We've always been part of God's plan throughout all of history because Christ was coming therefore we also needed to come. Okay. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 9 through to 10 Paul says, he's made known to us the mystery. This is a mystery. It's not something that we would know. It's a mystery that's been revealed in Christ Jesus. So, of his will, according to good pleasure that he purposed in Christ, that had been put into effect. So it was a mystery which was already purposed in Christ that would be put into effect at a certain time in history when the times would reach their fulfillment to bring to unity all things in heaven and on earth under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Okay, so it's a mystery hidden, now revealed, in time, to bring all things in heaven and earth under the authority of Jesus Christ, whether in the invisible world or in the visible world. Okay, it's a mystery hidden, now revealed. And when the, the mystery is unveiled, we can see it actually that all of history <coughs> is rushing towards this point. The future makes sense of the present and the past. But so we therefore see that the crucifixion and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ are central in human history because they were the chief events planned and purposed before anything else. Their plan A, which then leads us to Adam and Eve, you know, that what happened in the garden was always part of God's plan because Christ had to come.
come, because Christ was plan A, not plan B. This is why Paul in Romans chapter 5 can write, Adam was a type of the one who was to come. Christ was first, Adam was the copy of the one who was to come. Okay, so now we've got back in our minds and we're bending time and how time is revealed to us. I mean, we're in time, are we? We're creatures who experience time in, in two, you know, this very one dimensional sense or half a dimensional sense, the only goes forward. Um, but, you know, if you're not a being limited by time, then it's obviously going to work differently at all. Um, but Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel, which is God with us. It's one of those, a prophecy given 600 years before the coming of Jesus Christ, that the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. Then in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, just as the northern kingdom is going off into exile, and you can imagine the grief of the people as they see their brothers and sisters going into captivity under the Assyrian yoke. And the Assyrians weren't nice people. We know from our archaeology and their records that you know, they would flay their enemies alive, they would skin them alive and things. You know, these aren't nice people at all, and they're going away into exile. And Isaiah says, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who distress. In the past, he humbled the land of, ne of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. For the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light. So and again, one of those verses we read at Christmas time to talk about Jesus coming from Galilee of the nations, how he was born in Nazareth, there in the north, in the land there. But it's Isaiah seeing that that land that's now barren, where the people have been exiled from, that a light will come from there and bring light to the nations. Uh, Isaiah chapter 9. Verse 6, for us a child has been born, a son has been given. He shoulders responsibility and will be called Wonderful Advisor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. In Isaiah chapter 11, 1 and 2, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom, of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. So these are all messianic prophecies about the one who will arise and go forth from the land of Judea. That David's fallen stump will sprout again, will sprout again, and a new king will arise, and the spirit of the Lord will rest upon his individual. And that's how the Gospels speak of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he was a man empowered by the Spirit who went around doing immense things. And these Messianic prophecies are well known, you know, they've been around within Judean culture and their sacred writings for 600 years until the time of Christ. And they're well known. Obviously, everyone in Judean culture is going to be fully aware of these prophecies when Jesus arise. So much so that um, there's a story of when the Jewish war breaks out with the Romans and uh, when the temple is destroyed, that Jesus is prophesied will be destroyed in AD 70. So the Roman emperor, the future emperor Vespasian, when he arrives in Judea, two Jews come up to him and say, you know, there's all these prophecies in our sacred writings about someone coming from Judea who will then become ruler over the nations. We believe it's you, Vespasian. And he sort of likes this idea, obviously, and so he uses it in his propaganda, you know, that he's the promised one in the Judean scriptures. And he does become the emperor of Judea, um, but also, as Christians are proclaiming another king. 
he wasn't an emperor of Rome, but was rather killed on a cross by the Romans, and he rose again. So the coming one is a key theme within Isaiah, that this one is coming who will come and rule all the nations. And that all the nations of the earth will one day give their allegiance to this Judean peasant king, the one on the cross. So theme number three is John and Jesus. In Isaiah 40, we're told about the coming of who, the one who Jesus identifies as John the Baptist, a man with the spirit and the power of Elijah. We're told he'll be a voice of someone shouting in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord. And we see here um, that this messenger is followed in Isaiah with the servant of the Lord. So we read in Isaiah chapter uh, 42, uh, we read verses 1 and 4. Look at my servant whom I will strengthen. He is my chosen one who pleases me. I put my spirit upon him. He will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or raise his voice in public. He will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. He will bring justice to all who have been wronged, and he will not falter or lose heart until justice prevails throughout the earth. Even distant lands beyond the seas will wait for his instruction. The last line in the Greek version of Isaiah is slightly different. It reads, in his name will be the hope of all the world. And that's the version that Matthew puts in his gospel, that in his name will be the hope of all the world. I love the, the description of Jesus here. So Isaiah is talking about John the Baptist, he's talking about the forerunner who will prepare, prepare the way for the servant of the Lord who is coming. Um, but he then describes Jesus, he says he will bring justice to the nations. And this is the all of hope. Christians, that when Jesus returns, uh, he will judge the earth in righteousness. He will set the world to right. I think all of us are very aware that it's not right, that there's many injustices in the world, and we're looking forward to the king who will set the world to right. We're told he will not crush the weakest reed nor will he put out a flickering candle. I think this is a hope for all of us, especially as we go through periods in our lives where our faith is weak, or we might lose faith, or we might lose heart, or we might doubt, that we trust in a God who says he will not crush the weakest reed, nor will he put out a flickering candle, but rather he bears with us in those moments so that we can plan, plan and plan and plan doing that. Okay. It's an encouragement to all of us that the God who comes and dwells among us, knowing all of our pain, knowing all of our bitterness, knowing all of our suffering, and will bring justice to all who have been wronged, who have been neglected, to all who have been wronged. And I think this is one of those moments that Paul writes when he writes to the churches. He, he says, do not take revenge for others, no revenge belongs to God. And it's that sort of, we don't have to step out and take matters into our own hands. Because we know that one day all of us will give an account before God, and He will judge all, and He will make all wrongs right. We don't know how that will be, we don't know in what sense that will be, but we know that even in our lives, when we've wronged others, that we have to give an account for that as well. But 
we don't have to worry that our basic wrongs because God will make things right in the end. And that takes a burden off us of not having to hurt others. And we can be free to forgive and to live in the light of the forgiveness. In his name will be the hope of the world. I mean, going back to Good Friday, as the disciples of all flesh, as Christ is hung upon that instrument of torture, as he's being executed, all of his friends have run away. They, they, you know, they, he's full of hunger and they cut the fact that he's come back from the dead. Because why they cut something so ridiculous? They were but someone who has been publicly executed by the Romans is now alive. No one's going to believe them. And you can imagine how many people didn't believe them as they said this. They'd, they'd all run away. They'd all run away. And yet, in his name will be the hope of all the world. And we see the history of risk in the life of the enemy. So, if the end is that all the nations will be streaming to Jerusalem, that's how we read the beginning of the Isaiah. All the nations streaming to Israel to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles and all those things as Ze Zechariah speaks about. If that's the end, with every name in heaven and earth and under the earth being allegiance to Jesus Christ, if that's the end, then it works backwards that everything that we experience in our lives is working towards that end. Then everything will be put under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, that in his name will be the hope of all the world. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we just continue to read through uh, the book of Isaiah, Help us to have some of these themes in our minds, Lord. How the glory of the Lord is revealed in Jesus of Nazareth. How he is the one who was promised from ages past, now revealed as the mystery of the Lord. <coughs> and also that in his name all the nations will put their Amen. trust. That the picture of the end of history is with all of the nations, all those in heaven and earth and under the earth, giving their allegiance to the reigning Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 I'm just going to invite Tim now, who's going to lead us in a final song before we share our lunch.